There's the zero graphic drum. You have a computer. You have a laser. The computer drives. You have some optics and a mirror, and you shine the scanning beam onto the surface of the drum, and you turn the beam on and off. So this would make the laser print. This is basically the business end of the fax uh, machine. But there were some problems to solve. Would computers ever be able to do this? This is 1969. Um, most of you weren't around in 1969, but if you go back and look at these things, they were giant boxes. Um, maybe a little really wealthy, you had 16K in memory. And uh, would, they, would you make this work? I wanted the machine to print one page per second. That meant I had to generate at least a megabyte of data to print on the page. In the actual prototypes, we ended up printing three times that number. We ended up printing 30, 30 megabits of data on the page. So if I print a uh, page at 300 spots per inch, then I'm going to have to have 7 million points on this page. Could one store that much data cost effectively? Uh, could I make an optical device to produce 7 million points in one second? And would anyone want such a thing if it did work? I was less concerned about the last point. I was very much fascinated by the flying lights and getting all this to work and the fact that it functioned. Well, my manager hated this idea, and he was really upset with my pursuing this. I had hidden it as well as I knew how behind the black curtain, two of them necessary. Um, but he grabbed me one day and said, look, I want you to stop this project, or I'm going to lay off your people and maybe even you. Well, I'm the type of person that that's exactly the wrong thing to say to me. Because I thought I had something going there. And I thought, you're right, we're not going to let this happen. So, he overloaded me with minutia to keep me busy so I wouldn't work on this thing. What he didn't know is I took it home and did it at night so I could work on the laser thing in the daytime. Um, my wife wasn't too happy about me having all kinds of papers out on the table at night, but she <coughs> kind of understood. Uh, the effort only drove me harder, and we were rapidly reaching a watershed of opinions here. I mean, we had pretty much um, negotiating in gunboat style here. So, I knew I could make this thing work, and I wasn't about to let someone tell me. I had two young children, a wife, lots of bills, not much money, and I was ready to go with this thing. Um, much the same story comes out of a fellow by the name of Steve Sasson, who's the inventor of the digital camera. He said, if you really want to be popular, go to Kodak Management and tell them you just invented a camera that doesn't use film. And so, um, you know, he found himself in a very unpopular position as well. <laughs> not to mention the fact that if they had listened to him, they'd still be in business. So why the skepticism? Well, let's be fair here. Lasers were expensive and short lived. They might last a couple hundred hours on the whole thing. You know, considering that there's 10,000 hours in a year, that's not very long. It's like a week of continuous use. But that was at this point in time. Uh, modulating a laser beam was space like stuff. Okay? This was something in which, you know, the military would do it, but it's not something that you did in regular practice. Uh, Microcomputers and ICs were sparse at best. I mean, you really didn't have integrated circuits at this point in time. We'll talk about that in a minute. Computer disks were two to five megabytes maximum. Uh, the first commercial hard drive was called the RAMAC by IBM. It contained five megabytes of data and cost five million dollars. So it's a million dollars in that 16 kilobytes of computer memory cost two thousand dollars. The best the printer I had required 60 times that much. So that's 120 thousand dollars in memory. And the reason this is because the laser printer is a synchronous device. Once you start that page going, you can't stop and wait for data. It's got to all be there, ready to go. So I actually needed the data spooled up, ready to go, when I started the page. Well, could you expose a photoconductor in this short a time? I had to expose it in 10 nanoseconds. Now, the reason the question with this is that in the photographic business, which was really strong at that point, there's something called reciprocity failure. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that term or not. Maybe you have. Reciprocity failure is the fact that a short exposure that a high brightness isn't the same as a long exposure at a dull brightness. They're not the same. So, for example, you can't take a picture with a 12-day exposure on film, but very low light, and get the same result as a flash exposure of the same scene. You have to adjust quite a bit, sometimes in fact, in order of magnitude change in exposure to do that. And they said, no photo conductor is ever going to respond in 10 nanoseconds to a flash of light. Well, let's see how wrong we were. 
the scanning mirror would be way too costly and unreliable. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. So this is what knowledge would tell you. It's a nice set of problems here. Yep, they're all right. Microcomputers were sparse. Yep, computer disks were expensive. Yep, 16 kilobytes of memory did cost $2,000. Um, and one of the troubles that you will often run into in business is people only judge what they can do based upon what's available at the time they want to do it. They don't look out in front of the problem very far. So, a godsend occurred. Xerox formed the Palo Alto Research Center in 1970, about July. I called them and said, how do I get out here? And they said, well, what is it you want to do? I described my printer, and they invited me out to talk to them. Well, little did I realize they had a group of people who recently won major awards, uh, Chuck Thacker and Butler Lance and some of the others, for inventing the personal computer. And they were doing a bitmap screen full of pixels, and they were puzzled because they worked for a printing company. How in the world are we going to put this image on paper? And when I went out there and said, well, you know, I got this printer that put some points. And I can take the points off your screen and put them on the paper. They were thrilled. So the point is, I had a chance maybe to go to California. So here's part where the following things came into being. The personal computer, the Alto, bitmap graphics and scalable fonts, hmm. the Ethernet, the basis of internet communications, the laser printer, imaging languages like PostScript. I worked with Charles Geschke and John Warnock. They were right next to me in offices. Before PostScript, there was a language called JAM, J-A-M, because John Warnock and Martin Newell were the creators of it, so it stood for John and Martin, okay? And so that's how the language got started. And this was a scalable language. You could paint anything on the page you wanted. Xerox said it's a bad idea. They left the company for Adobe, and so that's where PostScript came from. So already the building east was leaving the farm. Um, or object-oriented computing, small talk, things like that came from. Good book if you want to read it. Uh, Michael Hilsick, who used to be part of the LA Times, uh, wrote this book called Dealers of Lightning. It's a great book because each one of us are interviewed in there, and they will give you the personal story of that particular piece of the technology, from the Alto to the Ethernet. Of course, you know, the Ethernet wasn't popular at Xerox either. What happened to that company? How ah, about Metcalf from 3 count. So these things all went flying away into profitable endeavors. So here's the genesis of the PC, because the Alto was part of this whole thing. That's what an Alto computer looked like. It was made this machine unique because it was developed in 1971, 1973. 64 kilobytes of memory. Wow. Uh, but at that time, it was a lot. If you really had good lab money, you could actually buy one with 256 kilobytes of memory called a fat Alto. And um, you could get Ethernet connectivity. And it operated the laser printer through some very clever software. Um, and they cost $30,000 each in 1970 for about $115,000 at today's, today's prices. Did people want them? They were mortgaging their families to get one of these things. So in October of 1970, I sat down with a senior VP at Xerox and gave him a choice. I'll build a laser printer for you, or I'll build it for IBM and take your choice. Now, that sounded pretty heady, and I frankly expected them to walk in, strap me to a missile, and launch me somewhere, because they you know, probably would go home without a job. But interestingly enough, he said, OK, you can go. Because my boss had told me, not only do I want you to stop this project, you're not transferring anywhere. But I'm thinking that that's a violation of corporate policy. Because I'd read the book. I was prepared for this battle. And I basically told him, you just blew your cover, because you can't say that to me. So we went to battle, and I actually won on this particular one. I called my wife and said, would you like to move from Rochester, New York, to Palo Alto, California? She said, I'll have the furniture in the street by the time you get home. And so uh, it was a pretty happy transition. I built the first laser printer by the end of 1971. I'll show you some pictures. Had a working prototype others could use by 1972, and a full-service unit by 1973. So. Here's the biggest problem I had to solve. We had a scanning mirror uh, in there, and that mirror had about 30 facets on it. And it had to go around and around, and each one would reflect a laser beam. Well, the problem is those facets had to be very accurate to the axis of rotation, which had itself be accurate, to about one arc second. And one arc second is the diameter of a dime in a mile. And so you'll find out that such mirrors are not inexpensive. 
that cost about $20,000 in production at that time. So this was not going to be a very cost-effective solution. Um, so how do I get this to work? How do I get this to work? Well, I went home for the weekend, a week or so, and mowing the lawn one Saturday, if you ask my wife, she'll tell you, she said he mowing the lawn, he shut off the mower and I didn't see him for 11 years. Um, I ran off to work because I had this idea, and what I did was the following. I found out that if I actually put a cylinder lens in the beam, all the errant beams all come back to a common focus. The neat thing about this is, this was a $10 solution which included the tolerance requirement by a factor of 100. And it solved the problem. I got six patents on this thing, and it really made a good change. This was a huge roadblock out of the area. Now, laser printers and scanners had occurred up until that time, but the Air Force had built them. $50,000, $100,000 scanners, you know, buried in some belly of an airplane, and they fly over and scan on curved film and all that kind of stuff. But this was something which you didn't need any of that stuff. So here's the basic system. You have a laser, you have a modulator, which now is the Paco sub. It only takes 100 volts, so it's easy to use. This is 1971. Some lenses to shape the beam. Through the cylinder lens, and then we had something here called SOS and EOS, start of scan and end of scan because we had to synchronize the computer signal with the scan beam, otherwise things just tear and so forth, like horizontal synchronization in the TV. So, basically all we did was to change the xerographic process from where you do the normal charging and suppose we just shot a laser in there instead of shining light from a, from a copy lens. And it was that simple. In fact, Xerox was the only company to do it that way. Other companies had decided because of short laser lifetimes, they would do the reverse. They would develop the non-charged areas. That way they only had to turn the laser on when they wanted a signal, when they wanted a mark. I had to turn mine, I had to erase the background, so my laser was on a lot more. The nice thing, however, was I could take a copier right out of the factory, rip the optics off, stick this thing in, and it would run. So I was trying to do something which had the least objections to management. So, here's a basic system, and I'll show you. Here's the laser. This is the modulator. Here's the optics. That's the scan mirror right there in that little housing. There's a scan detector, the mirror, the cylinder lens, and so forth. So, here's the basic system. You can see we put some plastic rods in where the light beams would go and illuminate them so you can kind of see where the laser light went. It's very fortunate that laser, that the light does not interact with itself. And so development history, first laser printer November 71, the first user-friendly printer was out in 72. At Park we had a rule, we had four levels of technology. Level one is, it's occasionally usable by the inventor, okay? Level two is, always usable by the inventor, occasionally usable by a trusted colleague. Level three is, always usable by the first two, and maybe even an end user can use it, and the fourth is, it'll actually work when you're not standing next to it. We built 35 prototypes called Dovers. That's because they produced very nice, quite clean sheets of paper, and this was named for the white of Dover by an English guy that worked with me. Um, the first Xerox laser printer product was in 1977, and I'll show you pictures of that later. Now, the point is there were many dirt fights in this whole process. Huge battles back and forth, there were alternative proposals and so forth, but they claimed that this whole thing would be too costly and too unreliable. That's what the knowledge would tell you. Were they right? So the first thing is, will this ever be a product? This was my first prototype. Uh, there's the big long optical cell, there's the spinning mirror, this is all optical bench parts. You can see that laser was a 500 milliwatt argon laser to put in there. The reason is, is that no one believed the photoconductor would respond in that short of time. So they insisted that I buy a $30,000 water-cooled argon laser to have enough power. In one day, we ended up putting filters in them to knock the power down to 3 milliwatts, which is what the calculation would have indicated anyway, because there was no reciprocity failure in the photo conductor. Uh, but it was fun to have a big laser. So the research center is growing, and I had gotten this printer working, and we were excited about it. Uh, first, if you look it up on Google, you'll find that the first park center was at a place called 3180 Porter Drive. And it was an old Encyclopedia Britannica building. And my first lab had the windows about this level. I 
have no idea what they had in there prior to my arrival. Uh, but it looked to me like they either had monkeys or alligators or something down there. I have no idea. It certainly wasn't built for human beings. But anyway, uh, we built that lab up. And my management decided that they needed to add a new building because we were growing. I was the 26th person to come aboard Park. And we eventually grew to 450 people. So we had to expand buildings to do that. Well, they came in one day and said to us, we bought a second building. Well, the problem was it's half a mile away and across the freeway. Now, this is really exciting because the people who were doing the image generation for me were next to my lab. They were also doing the image generation for the alto to do characters on the screen. So they announced that the computer people were moving half a mile away and across the freeway, and I was going to stay in this building. And I said, I'm just a little curious. How am I supposed to print on my printer with this thing? Well, just wait a year and a half till you're in the other buildings. I'm not waiting a year and a half for anything. So I couldn't put a cable across the freeway. That was not too popular. Uh, we couldn't put a tunnel underneath. You couldn't buy a microwave tower because the bandwidth wasn't enough. I needed 35 million points per second to drive this thing. So what, what did I do about all this thing? Well, I decided to go to my boss and I said, I've got an idea here. He said, go try it. So here's the view of the new building. I'm on the roof of the new building, looking across over here to my old building. So there's the, I think it comes in here. There's my old building. You'll notice the horses out there. This was Stanford University property. Uh, right now, that's the present site of the, the park building, if you were looking at it on Google. Um, again, in Stanford, you don't get to own the property. You get to lease the property. So you get a 99-year lease on this land. Well, the problem is, I looked up there and I said, I have a direct line of sight to my previous building. Mm -hmm. So what I did was the following. I bought four astronomical telescopes. <laughs> and I put two in the box on this building and two in the box on the other building. And I put a laser in one telescope, shined the beam down to the other end, and I put a photomultiplier tube in the other telescope and caught the light coming back up. So basically, my star to scan detector would send a pulse of laser light up to this box which would down, go downstairs and trigger the computer, which would put the data on the telescope and send it back to my building and print on my printer. And yes, it worked. Um, oh, boy. We call it a spool for Park Online Optical Link. 35 megabits per second. It ran for a full year until we got our buildings back together. It even worked in the fog. We only had one day we were down. I got a call once from the California Highway Patrol that asked if I could turn the beam down because one lady had driven into the ice plant and seen this red beam going over there at night. <laughs> and lost control of her car, so we ended up uh, turning the beam down on the whole thing. Um, and there you can see the laser beam coming up, coming up to the other tower that way. Um, basically, my helper and I used to stand on the buildings with walkie-talkies when it came time to tune these things and get them to adjust. The problem is these were flat buildings, very common in California, and when it rained, the roof would sag. And so the beams would go out of alignment. So we'd have to go up and adjust the beams back in again. As soon as the roof dried off, we'd have to readjust them again. But it was, it was pretty good since it didn't rain much in California anyway. So that problem was solved. Well, then we ended up taking the 7000 machine, which was filled with relay logic. And you can imagine 58 relays in this thing, electromechanical relays, clicking on and off. This was a signal nightmare going on free space with these coils falling and all the stuff that you would normally expect from falling currents and coils. It drove the electronics nuts. So we completely reworked the control system to be all digital with this. We made 35 prototypes of this. Well, following that, the company decided they wanted to make a product. And as I tell people, they didn't necessarily willingly do it. I went with a fellow who was going to make the product, Jack Lewis, who eventually became chairman of Bondo. And we went to the CEO of Xerox and said, we want to build this. And literally, he said to us, if I let you do this, will you leave me alone? Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, we promised to leave you alone if you let us do this. So we built this product, the Xerox 9700 printing system. It ran 300 spots per inch, two pages a second, and revolutionized the way you could print things. You could print manuals. It had two paper trays and a third one at the back, which meant it had 5,000 sheets of paper in this thing. We had 500 extra in the corner. And you could literally print books because you could put book covers in one tray, paper in the other one, you print the, paper, the book cover, three pages, back cover, fasten, and then have actually completed pages coming out. This was really much advanced because you didn't have to burst sheets of paper apart like you do on a computer. This was 
complete documents coming out of this thing. Not only that, there was enough paper in the back tree that if you ran out of paper in these trees, you had roughly three minutes to add paper without stopping the machine. The other advantage to this architecture was, should you have a glitch in the electronics, you could hold the sheet of paper until the image was completely written, and you knew that everything was okay before you released the sheet of paper. That way you never had to reprint or worry about sheets of paper getting mixed up in the document. It was very successful. Well, I had been warned by these people that they said, look, um, this is a nice page rate and this is good, but you've got to print at least 250,000 pages per month for this machine to pay for itself. Well, what really happened? Who realized volume was one and a half to two and a half million pages per month? You say, why not more? Because you couldn't print more than that, 120 pages per month. You had to feed and water this thing once in a while to go in there and change the oil and change the toner and at least tune it up. Uh, the first installation went to the Bank of America in Los Angeles, which had 14 of these machines running 24 hours a day. Xerox had five full-time employees at the Bay site just to keep shoveling toner and paper into these things to keep them going. And today, if you check most of your bank statements or any papers you get, they're all printed on printers like this. Not this particular one, because that's an old one. But nevertheless, it's all printed on printers like this. Uh, new markets were open, such as instant manual printing. The cut sheet printer could continuously print due to its novel feeding. You never really had to stop unless you ran out of toner, and then you did have to stop to put more toner in it. Um, you could put 32 pounds of toner in it, so it lasted a lot. Uh, you could feed covers and make books and so forth out of the whole thing. But some important data. Let's look at the prediction of the knowledge experts. What really happened? The photoconductor will not work. The pulse time is too short. You never had any problems. Spinning mirror bearings will not last very long. One of the Xerox executives was from Ford Motor Company. And he came to me once and he said, let me tell you something. He said, Kindle motors won't last at 10,000 RPM. I, got, I said, over here. He came close to me and I said, it's not a Kindle motor. You know, you got to understand this is a rotating disc on a shaft. Anyway, he thought it would fail. We never, ever had a failure with a spinning mirror. To my knowledge, not one. Electronics will cost way too high to sustain any business. I will show you what happened to the electronics cross and how bad what they knew was. Only 300 machines will be sold. I have a document in my files from the strategic planners saying only 300 of these will ever be sold. They sold 25,000. And that's because we got a new model coming out and we can make any more of those. Not enough printing will make the machine a dollar loser. Each machine made a profit of $10,000 a month. Printers will hurt the core copier business. The big concern was, well, everyone's going to the printers and there goes our copier business. That's where we make all our money. Never hurt the copier business. It boom. Why? Because the company was viewed as, as a leader in information transfer. So people wanted more Xerox equipment, not less because of that. Now, one thing I want to show you is in a broad team, we're going to look at it later. One of my students was kind enough to carry this handball over for me. This is a prototype laser scanner here. You can come and take a look.